hello, this is Professor St. Clair and the baby is asleep. So I'm ready to talk to you about the genes lecture. And this is some material that is not in the book. Um, as you can see, it's from a different textbook and um, it's a little bit more in depth. So let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so the genome is going to be the full collection of all of the DNA in the organism. And we can have both the nuclear genome, and that's going to be contained in the nucleus, just like the name uh, entails. Or we could also have some plastid genomes. So an example of this would be uh, like the uh, chloroplast genome. And it's going to contain genes that are required for photosynthesis, but it's not going to have all of them. Some of the genes for photosynthesis will be uh, inside of the nucleus. Um, beyond that, if you think about some of the other organelles that are in the cell, we also could have the mitochondrial genome. Okay, remember the mitochondria are the energy factories of the cell. And the interesting thing about the plastid genomes is that the way that they're passed down is going to be maternal. Um, an example of how this applies to plants with the mitochondrial genome is that the seed coat is controlled by the mitochondrial genome. So if you think about the uh, different types of variation that you could have in beans, for example, that's going to be passed down to the progeny from the mother and it's part of the mitochondrial genome. So it has a certain kind of inheritance. Um, this also relates to uh, chapter three in Stern's plant biology. Um, if you remember, there was a section in the chapter that talked about endosymbiotic theory. Okay, and uh, endosymbiotic theory has to do with the idea that uh, smaller organisms were engulfed by larger organisms. So, for example, you might have um, like a bacteria or maybe a, like a photosynthetic cyanobacteria that could be engulfed by a protist. Okay, and then that may have given rise to the eukaryotes. Okay, and what's really interesting is that with genetics, there has been some evidence of this as well because you find the same sequence in these, um, like the chloroplast genome or a mitochondrial genome in some of these organelles that you find in uh, the bacteria or the other prokaryotes. So another thing here you may ask, and the re this is the reason why I'm uh, providing some notes with this on the side here. Uh, you may ask, uh, what is this you're talking about, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells? So the prokaryotic cells are going to lack a nucleus, and then the eukaryotic cells uh, have a nucleus. Um, and I've always wondered with the endosymbiotic theory, even though that we have some evidence for it, I'm really just not sure where the nucleus came from. That's not clear to me and it's not explained by the theory. Um, so if you think about the scientific method and you think about what we talked about near the beginning of the class, um, the theories are going to be supported by a lot of evidence, but it doesn't mean that it's proven. And for any of these uh, theories, we can't actually prove beyond a doubt that they are true, but we could potentially find evidence that could prove that they're false. Okay, so more on that later. <clears throat> okay, so if you look over here at these slides, then we have the genome size uh, for different organisms. And it's interesting because we have an example with E. coli, and that's going to be in the millions of base pairs. And then for uh, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's going to be the yeast that's used to make beer. So that's why it's cerevisiae. Uh, that one has 
about 10 million, or I should say 13 million base pairs of DNA. Um, and it gets a little bit more complex if you go through the insects, the fish, um, and then for mammals like Homo sapiens, um, then it's 3.2 times 10 to the ninth. So looking at billions of base pairs there. Okay, but then if you compare that to plants, then the plants also have a large genome size. And if you look at some of these different beans like the uh, Vichia fava, then you're actually looking at 1.3 times 10 to the 10th for the genome size and base pairs. Um, so the reason for this is that with these different plants, there's a large amount of duplication in the genome. So you'll have sequences that are repeated, um, potentially sequences that are repeated many times. And for quite a while, um, we just thought that this was nonsense, but we're coming to find out that some of these sequences may have roles in regulating genes, even though a lot of these highly repetitive sequences do not actually encode for genes themselves. Okay, um, so this is the uh, fundamental paradigm of biochemistry also is how I've learned it, and it's DNA, RNA, protein. So remember that DNA is like the template. It's going to have all of the genetic information and it's always there uh, within the cells, within the nucleus and these plastid genomes. Um, then the DNA is going to be transcribed to RNA by an enzyme called RNA polymerase. That's only gonna happen when the genes are expressed. And then for the protein, the protein um, that's encoded for by the DNA is going to give us a trait that we can actually see. This is what I was alluding to earlier. There's a lot of excess DNA um, and some of the genomes have been duplicated. So a good example of this would be with uh, tetraploid wheat. Hmm. So that seems like we're coming up with some new terms here. So we can have uh, diploid cells. We also call these uh, 2N. And these are going to have two copies of the genetic information. Okay, so the uh, diploid cells, a good example of that would be for human cells, okay, just like you and me, um, these cells are going to have two copies of the genetic information, one from mom and one from dad. Okay, another uh, type of ploidy or amount of chromosomes that we can have, um, amount of copies of chromosomes that we can have would be for the haploid cells we can also call those 1N, and those are going to have one copy of the genetic information. Um, and the best example of this is gonna be for the gam gametes. So with humans, we can think about the sperm and the egg. Uh, for plants, we can think about the pollen and the ovule. And remember, if we're going to get a cell um, at the end that's a body cell that has two copies of the genetic information, then we want the, the gametes or the sperm, for example, to bring in one copy. So that's the reason why they are haploid cells and um, the haploid cells are generated as a result of uh, meiosis. Okay, we could also have polyploid cells and just like the name entails, the polyploid cells are going to have many copies of the genetic information. Okay, and the tetraploid wheat is an example of a polyploid type of plant, and uh, they are a result of genetic doubling or genome doubling, I should say. Um, if you have many copies of the same gene, one reason um, as an adaptation that the plant might evolve this way could be to have a backup copy. So if there's some sort of mutation, one of the proteins is broken, um, then 
you could still have a backup coffee that could allow the plant to carry out its normal functions or maybe to have a defense. Okay, but for a lot of this stuff, we still really don't know what it's for and it is an active area of research. Okay, so chromatin, I um, put a little note here at the top. It's going to be made out of the DNA and protein. And it's really remarkable the way that these chromosomes are able to fit so much DNA into a tiny nucleus. So with the vitiofava, there are 12 chromosomes present and the uh, nucleus is very tiny, only 10 to 15 micrometers. Um, let's take a look at the figure here. Okay, so here we can see the nucleosome, okay? Um, and then the histone is going to be made up of proteins. Uh, and there's going to be a little bit of linker DNA that's going to link together um, each of these coils right here. Okay, so you guys might be familiar with the double helix is the structure of DNA, but then as the DNA is packed um, tightly into the nucleus, um, it's going to be wrapped around these histones joined together with the nuclear DNA. Uh, the DNA and the histones together is called the nucleosome. Okay, just like we're showing over here on the left. Um, and then the nucleosomes, as they're getting twisted, um, they're kind of like beads on a string. And um, then we have the chromatin fiber that's made up of the nucleosomes here. So the barrel shaped structure is called the nucleosomes you just saw on the slide there. Um, and then the histones are made up of proteins. Okay, so you can get about 150 base pairs of DNA wrapped around the nucleosomes. Okay, and then within 30 nanometers of chromosomes, six of these nucleosomes are going to be wrapped together. All right, there it is again. Okay, now let's look a little bit closer at gene expression. Um, the enzyme that transcribes RNA from DNA is RNA polymerase. Um, but these uh, enzymes that make the copies of the DNA into RNA are going to be uh, controlled by transcription factors and the enzymes cannot interact directly with the DNA template. Okay, so in order to recruit the transcription factors, um, there are promoter sequences, and the sequences are going to be the cat and tata boxes. Okay, so using the sequence CAAT and TATA, these are going to help to recruit the uh, transcription factors. Okay, so when you think about the promoters, which are going to be upstream of the gene or before the gene, um, you can think of come to the DNA party, okay? Just like they're promoting an event or a concert or something like that. These are going to be responsible for recruiting uh, transcription factors. Okay, so let's see, maybe we have a model of the uh, structure of a gene. Okay, so you may also have enhancers that are going to enhance the expression of the gene or upregulate it. Um, here are the cat and the tata boxes, and here's going to be the start codon. So that's going to tell uh, RNA polymerase to start. Um, the Coding sequence, that's going to be the part that codes for the protein that actually is the gene itself. The introns are going to be intervening sequences. They're not actually um, part of the protein. And other than the introns, we can also have exons. Okay, so if you look here at the graphic, the introns look kind of purple, and then the exons are the part that look beige. Okay, so with the introns, one way to remember this is that these are intervening sequences. 
And for the exons, these are going to be later excised or cut out. Okay, so, you know, there may be like a cut here, here, and here, as these are um, later going to be translated as your protein. Okay, and then for the polyadenylation sig signals, sometimes we call that a poly-A tail. Um, that's going to be there in case the uh, DNA is damaged and a little bit of it is cut off for that gene. It's going to give it a little bit of extra tape, basically. Okay, and then here, the transcription stop, that is going to be uh, the stop code. So another reason why plants have so much DNA is because they have a lot of introns. Those are those intervening sequences that I mentioned. And the exons, which are later excised, those are the coding sequences, those code for protein. So amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Okay, and here we have the list of all of the amino acids, and they are abbreviated by these one-letter abbreviations. You don't need to memorize these, but I just want you to be aware of them. Okay, and I do want you to know that amino acids are the building blocks of protein. Okay, so I mentioned the uh, nuclear genome versus the plastid genomes, and the chloroplast and mitochondria do not have all of the genes that are needed for their functions in their genomes. Um, they have plastid genomes. So these are going to be uh, small circular genomes. And these are also contained in bacteria. Okay, so upstream from the promoter, you may have an enhancer. Okay, so that's going to upregulate or make the gene express more often. Uh, on the other hand, you could have genes that are downregulated um, by sequences that are called silencers, and those are going to reduce binding the promoter's site by the transcription factors. Okay, so there could also be a uh, modification of chromatin, okay, by epigenetics, and this would either upregulate or downregulate. So let's take a look. All right, so for methylation, this is going to silence a gene, and this would be where you have the modification of chromatin, chromatin by uh, a methyl group. The methyl group basically is just going to be CH3, okay? So it's going to be our carbon with three hydrogens attached to it. And what happens is if you have this CH3 or methyl group attached to this, the outside of the DNA, then that is going to block the uh, transcription factors from attaching. On the other hand, the genes could be upregulated. Let's take a look. So this is going to be for gene silencing. And then for acetylation, this is going to be where you'll have the modification of chromatin by an acetyl group. And this is going to uh, upregulate or enhance the gene expression. Okay, so here we have um, a lot of electronegativity with the oxygen that's double bonded to the carbon here. Um, and that is going to actually open up the area and make it easier for the transcription factors to get in there and for RNA polymerase to come in and um, make the copies into RNA. I should say transcribe the genes into RNA uh, so that they can be expressed more often. Okay, so um, there are two different types of nucleic acids. So we have um, DNA, and then DNA is double-stranded, and it's very stable. Uh, you can even boil DNA, and it can 
still have the same sequence. Okay, it can still go back together. Um, and then there's RNA. Okay, let's try that again. Um, so DNA is a nucleic acid that is the template. It is double-stranded and it's very stable. Um, it can even be boiled. There is uh, fossiled, fossilized DNA that has been sequenced um, and the sequence is uh, still somewhat intact. Okay, on the other hand, there's also RNA, and RNA is double stranded and it's unstable, so it can break down easily and it can break down pretty quickly. Okay, um, and there's a reason for this because inside the plant, there's going to be differential expression. Okay, so with differential expression, basically that means that all of the genes are not going to be expressed at the same time, but you'll have a different set of genes that's expressed during different parts of the life cycle of the plant. So for example, um, at the time of germination, you wouldn't want the genes for flowering to be expressed, okay? Um, but at the appropriate part of the life cycle of the plant, when reproduction is taking place, that's when you're going to have the expression of the genes that are related to flowering. Okay, so with that, um, that's the reason that the RNA is unstable. The RNA is going to break down easily so that after the gene is expressed, um, it's not going to hang around and keep uh, using up the resources in, inside of the cell. This transcript is not going to hang around, but it'll be broken down quickly. Um, but the template is stable, the DNA is stable, and it's still available. <laughs> Okay, and the plant signals from uh, hormones are one of the forces that are going to control this differential expression and tell the plant, for example, based on maybe uh, genetics or environmental cues when it's time to flower, uh, as an example. Okay, so now we are beginning to get into the plant hormones, um, and we'll start out with um, some of the effects of what was later termed auxin, and that is phototropism. And with phototropism, plants bend for blue light. Okay, so you might have noticed this maybe if you grow a plant um, near a window. Um, or source of light that the plant will tend to bend toward it. And this is actually due to a pigment that is a photoreceptor, and that pigment is called cryptochrome. Okay, and this is going to be um, the actual pigment that absorbs the blue light. And it's present in the shoot tip. Okay, it was uh, named cryptochrome because it was a mystery at the time what was causing plants to bend toward a source of light, um, cryptic, um, a mystery, that sort of thing. That's why it was named cryptochrome. Okay, so there were experiments that were uh, carried out by Fritz Wendt, and Fritz Wendt cut off the coleoptiles or the shoot tips from grass seedlings, okay, and if the um, tip was removed um, and then there was a block of auger that was put in between the uh, shoot and the shoot tip, the plants would still bend toward blue light. Um, if there was uh, something more opaque or that couldn't be permeated, um, then that would prevent uh, the substance from moving from the shoot tip. So when uh, Fritz went was doing the... Okay, so let's take a look now at the experiments by Charles and Francis Darwin. 
Okay, so if you look here on the left, we have a coleoctail or a grass seedling. And um, if there's an opaque cap over the tip that doesn't allow light to pre penetrate, then we don't see any bending toward the source of light. Whereas if you have a clear cap, then the uh, bending still occurs, bending toward the light. Um, if there's an opaque sleeve over the stem, but not over the very tip of the shoot, then you're still going to see the bending. So these types of experiments let Charles Darwin know that there was something that was produced in the shoot tip that was causing this action where the plant would bend toward light. Okay, now here's something uh, similar to what we saw with Fritz Wentz experiment um, for Boyce and Jensen. There's a porous gelatin, like an agar, um, that was put in between a decapitated shoot tip and the stem. Um, and you can see that uh, with this permeable porous gelatin that the bending still occurred. If in uh, another case, the shoe tip was excised and there was a non-permeable barrier that was put in place between the stem and the shoe tip, then bending did not occur. So this gave the idea that if the uh, oxen was not able to travel downward in the plant, um, then the bending would not occur. And the way that this actually happens with oxen Oxen is a plant hormone that is associated with uh, elongation of the cells. Okay, what happens here is that the cells are going to quickly elongate just on one side of the plant, and on the other side, they're just going to elongate slowly. So, this is going to give the bending effect. Oxen was discovered by Fritz Wendt, and there are some other. Beginning with abscisic acid, um, this has to do with the closing of the stomata under drought stress. And also there are uh, hormones like abscisic acid that are produced in the seed coat that are associated with dormancy. Abscisic acid is also associated with uh, bud dormancy and woody species. Then there's auxin. Oxen is uh, used commercially for rooting, and it's associated with uh, the elongation of cells, including those that are present in shoots and roots. It is also responsible for gravitropism. That's where the roots grow downwards. It's a type of plant movement, um, as well as phototropism. And with the phototropism, that's where the plant is going to follow the source of light. Okay, oxen is in a balance with cytokinin, and cytokinin is responsible for the promotion of sprouting and lateral buds. So let's take a look at this. Um, for oxen, we also want to add that it's responsible for uh, control of apical dominance. And with the apical dominance, that's where you're going to have the growth that would be kind of like a Christmas tree. Okay, and it's in a balance with cytokinin. And remember that at each of the nodes, we have a lateral bun or an axillary bun. And cytokinin is going to be associated with the sprouting of those lateral buds. So in that case, if you have a higher ratio of oxen to cytokinin, um, more oxen than cytokinin, that is to say, um, then you're going to have more of that Christmas tree shape, more apical dominance. And if cytokinin is present in a higher concentration, um, then you're going to have more bushy growth habit and um, the side shoots are going to sprout more. Okay, next we have ethylene. Ethylene is uh, associated with the ripening of fruit, associated with Okay, and next we have gibberellic acid. Uh, gibberellic acid is associated. Next we have gibberellic acid. 
Gibberellic acid is responsible for seed germination, also for bud break in woody species. Um, it's also associated with elongation, but in this case, the elongation of the internodes for uh, gibberellic acid is responsible for internodal elongation. So that would be elongation of um, it's also associated with flowering. And it also can make fruit grow larger. Okay, so here's what I was talking about with the uh, effect where auxin is in equilibrium with cytokinin. And if you have a, a high concentration of auxin, then you're gonna have more of this Christmas tree shape. And if there is a high concentration on the other hand of cytokinin, then these lateral buds are going to sprout. Okay, so you can see how there are lateral buds that are present at the nodes, and these are going to sprout and um, give more of a bushy growth pattern. Okay, so these are the uh, statoliths and these are what are going to cause the plant to grow in a downward direction. So you guys actually looked at these under the microscope when you looked at the potato and you guys saw the starch grains and um, the statilis are within the starch grains and they're heavy. So they're going to allow the uh, plant to detect gravity so that the roots can grow downward. Next, let's talk about phytochrome. Phytochrome is another pigment. And phytochrome is going to absorb red and far red light. And there are two forms of phytochrome. There's PR. PR is going to absorb red light. Red light is going to be more like a bright sunny day. And um, there is also PFR, which is going to absorb far red light. Far red light is going to have a little bit of a lazier wavelength and it is more like shade. Okay, so there are some plants that are photoperiodic. And that's going to be where plants require a certain day length, whether it's a long day or a short day in order to flower. We have a few different examples here. So first let's look at the corn. Okay, so the corn is day neutral. The corn does not care if it's a long day or a short day. And when we have equal day lengths, where it is uh, 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark, then we are going to see flowers. Okay, on the other hand, if we have a short day um, and a long night, then we'll have a shorter period of, of light and a longer period of dark, we still see flowers. Okay, and then um, if we have long days and short nights, so a longer period of light and a shorter period of dark, then we're still going to have flowers for the corn. The corn is day neutral. Okay, on the other hand, um, there's the cockleburr. The cockleburr is a type of weed and it is a short day requiring plant. So it needs to have a short day to flower. Okay, so in the example here where you have an equal day length and it's 12 and 12, you're gonna see flowers with the cockleburr. Same thing if you have a, sh a short day and a long night. Okay, here you see flowers, but on the other hand, if you have a long day and a short night where there's a longer period of light and a shorter period of darkness, then the short day requiring cockleburr is not going to flower. All right, then the next example that we have is spinach. Uh, spinach is a long day requiring plant. And with that, 
If you have an equal day length and night where it's 12 and 12, the spinach is not going to flower. Under short day conditions, the spinach is not going to flower. But if you have long days and short nights, then you're going to see this bolting effect where you get the flowers with the spinach. And this is exactly what's going to happen if you grow your spinach out during the summer. Then you're going to get bolting and you're going to get flowers instead of getting a lot of greens. So this is really interesting. Um, here we have uh, a caterpillar and it has uh, velocitin in its saliva and it's volatile. It's going to go into the air um, and it will recruit parasitic wasps. Okay, and the parasitic wasps are going to lay their eggs on this caterpillar. And then when the uh, baby wasps are born, then they're going to parasitize and eat the caterpillar. Okay, so here we have um, the volatile compound that is released from the plant in response to the velocitin, and it's bringing in these parasitic wasps that are going to protect the plant. I really like that one. Okay, um, what about for plant communication? Okay, so if you have like a bog environment, um, it's going to be very well leached. Um, it's not going to have a lot of nitrogen in the soil. So you'll see plants kind of like the Venus flytrap that are predatory and they're going to catch insects and use them as a source of nitrogen. Okay, um, when they trigger the hairs on the Venus flytrap, then you're going to have a mechanism that is controlled by auxin. <clears throat> so right here, when the uh, Venus flytrap closes, that's actually going to be because the cells on the outer edge are going to elongate faster than the cells that are on the inside of the Venus flytrap. So that is going to cause it to snap shut. It's under the influence of auxin. Okay, so let's take a little bit closer look at auxin. Okay, uh, auxin is going to be used commercially to root cuttings. All right, and it's going to promote adventitious roots. Um, I like to refer to adventitious roots as roots where there were no roots before. Another way of putting this is that the uh, roots are developing from another type of cell. Other okay, and one example of auxin here is indole-3-acetic acid, or we just call this IAA. And indole-3-acetic acid, or IAA, is an endogenous auxin. And endogenous means that it's produced within the plant. So we can have either endogenous auxin or we can have exogenously applied auxin. That would be where we're adding something ourselves externally. Or where we're taking something and applying it externally. Okay, so that could be with IAA um, or you could also use IBA. Okay, IBA is naturally occurring as well. Um, IBA is also one of the common ingredients in our rooting gels or our rooting powders. And we're also given two examples here of synthetic auxins, including NAA and 2,4-D. So NAA similarly is a commercial product that you can get with the rooting hormones that you buy at the store. Um, those are used for rooting cuttings. And um, then 2,4-D is also potentially used for uh, an herbicide. Okay, so with that, we can take a closer look at the indole acetic acid or the IAA. That's one of the naturally produced auxins, okay? And we can see that if we consider the uh, relative elongation uh, basically to be a good thing, if we're going into the positive here, um, then we're going to have an increase with the 
IA concentration, okay, in the positive direction. But once we get past the optimum here, then we're going to have a decrease um, down to the point where actually the plant is going to die. So that's the deal with the oxen also possibly being an herbicide. There could be too much of a good thing and it can be toxic to the plant. Okay, so there are some more examples here um, of uh, chloroindyl acetic acid and phenyl acetic acid that are naturally occurring in addition to IAA. Okay, um, now if you've ever wondered about topping a plant or pinching in order to give a more bushy growth habit, this is the way that it works because the auxin promotes apical dominance. Um, if the apical bud is intact, then you're going to have um, more of the Christmas tree type of growth. And then those lateral buds are going to be very tiny and they're not going to sprout. Whereas if the plant is topped or the apical bud is removed, then you're going to see the axillary buds uh, shoot out and you'll get this more bushy growth habit. Okay, so keep in mind that auxin is responsible for cellular elongation. All right, and then on the other hand, there's cytokinin. Um, cytokinin is going to be used in plant tissue culture for the promotion of shoots. Um, and with cytokinin, you can think of cytokinesis. That would be cell division or mitosis. And think that if you have uh, more cytokinesis, then you're going to have more growth. So that's the idea behind cytokinin. Um, one of the natural occurring cytokinins is zeatin, and that's produced in uh, zeamyes. And you might also have uh, kinetin. That is one of the most uh, basic synthetic kinetins. That is one of the most basic. Um, or benzyl adenine, which is also known as BAP, and that's also very commonly used. Okay, and let's take a look at what we have next. Okay, so here we have uh, thiodiazeron. Uh, thiodiazeron is also known as TDZ, and TDZ is used for uh, woody cuttings. That's one possible application. All right, and next let's take a look at gibberellic acid. Um, a, it was discovered by a Japanese botanist um, and it's found in a wide range of plants, also algae and uh, fungi. Um, and it can be found in the apical buds as well as roots and it's involved in seed germination. Okay, so it's responsible for extensive growth. Um, for uh, dwarves, you could think about dwarf fruit trees. There are two different types of dwarves. Receptor mutant that cannot use gibberellic acid or a gibberellic acid producer mutant that cannot make gibberellic acid. Okay, so think about the fact that the gibberellic acid is going to promote the elongation of the inner nodes. That's going to make the plant larger or taller, okay? Um, if you spray gibberellic acid on the gibberellic acid producer mutant, it is going to cause the tree to grow larger. Whereas if you spray gibberellic acid on the receptor mutant that cannot use gibberellic acid, it's not going to have an effect uh, on the height of the plant. Okay, um, gibberellic acid is in an equilibrium with abscisic acid, similar to what we saw with the auxin and the cytokinin. Okay, it's involved in seed germination. So if you remember, abscisic acid was involved in seed dormancy. On the other hand, gibberellic acid is going to break dormancy of seeds, and it's also uh, involved with the breaking of the bud dormancy for our woody species. Uh, another thing is that gibberellic acid can stimulate flowering and it can also stimulate fruiting.
Okay, so it can be a little bit confusing with auxin and gibberellin because they're both responsible for elongation. The auxin is responsible for cellular elongation, whereas the gibberellin is going to be responsible for elongation in the internodes. So, like I mentioned, the auxin can also be used as an herbicide, so too much auxin is going to kill the plant. Whereas if you have too much gibberellin, then that is not necessarily going to be harmful. Um, gibberellic acid is not known to have a big effect on roots. Um, oxen is generally associated with rooting, but I have also heard um, that gibberellin can um, inhibit root formation in some cases. Okay, taking another look at abscite, that is going to slow down growth and also cause the stomatophores to close if there's a drought stress. Can you open the door for a minute, please? Along with being responsible for closure of the stomata, abscisic uh, acid is also associated with bud dormancy in woody species. Uh, it also will delay seed germination if it's present in uh, a higher concentration than the gibberellic acid. All right, and next let's take a look at ethylene. Ethylene is associated with uh, ripening of fruits, and remember it's associated with leaf abscission. Okay, leaf abscission is going to be when um, the leaves drop in the fall. Okay, so with um, fruit ripening, um, remember that when the fruits are not very ripe, they're going to be hard and then they're going to get softer as they become riper. And that's going to be because of the effects of ethylene. Um, cellulase is the enzyme that's responsible for starting to soften up and loosen, break down the cell wall. Um, and it also will, will work in conjunction with pectinase. Pectinase is an enzyme that's going to break down pectin, okay? And that's going to cause the fruit to get softer as it breaks down. And then those glucose monomers that make up the cellulose of the cell wall are also going to um, make the fruit sweeter as well. Um, ethylene can cause uh, leaf abscission as well as floral abscission. Um, and it also promote, promotes senescence. So senescence is going to be when the leaves start to turn colors and you start to see those carotenoids come out. So instead of just seeing the green color of the chlorophyll, you're going to start to see those yellows, reds, and oranges. Um, ethylene also has a commercial application, okay, where you can use it to uh, help with the ease of harvesting, okay? Remember with abscission, this would also potentially cause the fruit to drop if you think about something like cherries. And that's going to make uh, it easier to harvest if the abscission la layer begins to form in the petiole of the fruit. Okay, next I want to talk about the strigolactones, and this is really interesting because there are uh, parasitic plants called striga, and these parasitic plants um, often are not photosynthetic, so they're just going to look white, and they don't have any uh, chlorophyll to them. They are going to attach to plant roots, and then they're going to draw out the nutrients and uh, basically just parasitize the plants that are the host to them. Um, so they could potentially live in forests and parasitize uh, pine trees, or we also see this in commercial crops like cowpea. Um, and the strigolactones are going to be exuded by the plant roots. 
Um, and the purpose for the plant of exuding these strigolactones is going to be to recruit the mycorrhizal infection. Okay, and the mycorrhizae, these are fungus that are going to have a beneficial association with plant roots. And they are fungi. These strigolactones to recruit the beneficial fungi, but also possibly is going to stimulate the seed germination of these striga seeds, these parasitic plant seeds. And these striga seeds can remain dormant for a really long time. And that's also common with weed seeds as well um, and for wild plants. So these seeds from the striga will sit there and just wait in the soil until they are near a plant that's germinating that they can potentially attach to. I find it really interesting the way that plants are able to communicate with each other and also with other organisms. Thank you for listening to my lecture.